Нашли окупанти до нас в Україну Форма новенька воєнні машини Та трохи поплавився їх інвентар Байрактар Байрактар Російські танкісти сховали з кущі Щоб лавтим посорбати довба ніжчі Та трохи у чах перегрівся на бар Байрактар Великая страны. Доводи всяке озброєння, різне потужні ракети, машини залізні у нас на всі доводи є коментар. Байрактар. Байрактар. Вони захопити хотіли на зразу, а ми зачаїли на ордів образу з російських бандитів. Робить примар. Байрактар. Байрактар Російська поліція справи заводить Там пивцю рашистів ніяк не знаходить Хто винен, що в нашому полі глухар Байрактар Байрактар Веде пропаганду кремлівський урод Слова пропаганди ковтає народ Тепер нове слово знає цар Байрактар 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 Байрактар
Hello, everyone. I'm the Enforcer, and I'm accompanied by Enforcer Matt. Ian, good evening, folks. It's Enforcer Matt, and welcome back to Day 781 of the news. And it's good to see you all once again. And we're hearing that Israel plans on responding to Iran in a big, big fashion in less than 48 hours. So it's about to go down, and it's good to see you all once again. And, of course, we're going to be covering the past 48 hours of the news of the war in Ukraine. And we're also going to be covering the past 24 hours of the brand-new Israel-Iran war that has just started yesterday, which was covered live on air on an early special stream, which completely forgoed any kind of Ukraine war news. So we're we're going to be covering both Ukraine war news days today, and we're also going to be covering all of the major events that have been happening in the Middle East so far today as well. But before we get into that, I do have to say that tonight is the Sunday fundraiser night, and for a very rare exception, for one of the few times ever in the channel's history, we are actually running a nonprofit, uh, well, a fundraiser for a nonprofit that is not supporting Ukraine, but is actually supporting the Israeli Defense Forces of Israel. The reason why we had picked this fundraiser is that due to the massive events going on inside the Middle East, and considering that the Lee Spring Army is an international coalition of people from around the world that largely support Western interests, we decided that tonight it might be beneficial, considering that it is the second day of the outbreak of a major war in the Middle East, to run a large fundraiser to try and help out the Israeli Defense Forces. The friends of the IDF help out with uh, humanitarian efforts, relief efforts, and also medical efforts as well, providing a large amount of medical equipment to the Israeli Defense Forces, which most likely will be engaged in large actions against Hamas and Hezbollah, both uh, terrorist groups associated with the Islamic Republic of Iran, here in the coming days and weeks. But nevertheless, any support that is sent to the friends of the IDF will be massively appreciated by the Israelis and will hopefully be used to help uh, stomp and crush out uh, the terroristic forces of the Islamic Republic of Iran within the region. But we have to make sure to get into the massive amount of news that we have heard tonight out of the country of Iran. We've actually been able to get a little bit of a clearer picture of what happened yesterday and also what has been happening today as sporadic missile fire has still been heading into the direction of Iran as Hal Rose throws in a 333. Good <laughs> Lord. That was crazy. We are now up coming in. They're rolling in back to back pretty much. We are now up to $1,153 at this moment, and the fundraiser is absolutely blowing up, which is insane. But moving us on into Iran and making sure to get us into this news immediately from the area of the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran, we were able to see how the missile attacks went down from the Iranian commander's end last night. We actually got a complete video of their entire sequence of giving the order to fire, the missiles being fired, and everything else in between from an Iranian perspective. This was published today by an, uh, an Iranian news agency, and this was incredibly interesting to see, the kind of theatrics and showmanship that they put into this large attack. It largely seems they were trying to appease the public with how they presented this, but nevertheless, here is the footage that we have of the Iranian commanders actually calling up the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps battery commanders and giving them the orders to fire the missiles from inside of Iran. I just want to point out real quick, like, is this their so-called, like, situation room or command center or something? What is this? I have no idea what this is. But I would have to say this looks like the, this looks like a 1970s office complex they're inside of. And I also like, Matthew, the Microsoft print banner that they put up above them at the very top of the screen to make sure that you knew that this was the Iranian military or at least the Iranian government in some form. It looks like the nurse's station, like a hospital or something. They're out in the hallway, like, oh! conducting the attack. <laughs> it yeah, does. It really it? does. That is actually a It's like uh, Twiddly D and Twiddly Dumb up here at the table, like, on the phone. It, it's the most janky-looking setup I've ever seen for, like, a military operation. Dude, it really is. I mean, this looks incredibly archaic. And the fact that they only have a couple of phones in front of them is what's even crazier. And by the way, I want to give a huge shout out to everyone for having the fundraiser go absolutely wild right now. There are loads of massive donations coming in, and we've already reached close to $1,800 on the fundraiser in 18 minutes, meaning we're raising about $100 per minute, which is absolutely incredible. And I believe the Lee Spring Army is going to blow through the fundraiser goal tonight and get well beyond it. But getting back to the video... 
سپهمون پاسدار شهید حاج قاسم سلیمانی و سرنشکر پاسدار شهید محمد رضا زاهدی و سردار شهید And when you hear them getting the phone call, <laughs> letting them know that Uber Eats is here. <laughs> and the, the furniture sales are going wild in the Iranian military headquarters. <laughs> Also, what's up with the guy on the left, by the way? Just a quick observation and astute one, I suppose. Why in the world is he so far away from all the other generals that are spaced so close together? Is he, like, uh, is he like in the timeout corner or something like that? Because it looks like he's dejected over here, like he's not even involved in anything. He's just kind of sitting there menacingly, maybe. <laughs> What the? <laughs> oh, it's a caucus now. <laughs> Another sale just came in. Now here comes the action. Here are the Iranian missiles actually being fired from inside of Iran, as filmed by the Iranian government. I'll have you all know, looking in hindsight, hindsight being 2020, it's a little uh, hilarious to watch this being such a massive performance, knowing that every single one of these missiles, for the most part, save around, from what we heard, five to seven of them were shot down by Israeli and Allied coalition forces within the region. see them firing off more rockets unfortunately because it's nighttime when these rocket batteries were fired we don't really get a good look at the missiles themselves to get an idea of what kind they are And Eugene Minton, you were correct. Uh, the drones were fired 40 minutes before any of these missile batteries were launched, giving the Israelis a heads up that the missiles were going to be on the way. We now see the missiles flying out of Iran in this clip as they continue to show more montages and clips of the missiles being fired from inside of Western Iran. We see them continuing to fire even more missiles. We do have to remember that there was around 100 to 150 uh, cruise and ballistic missiles fired by the Islamic Republic of Iran overnight. And we now see them showing the missiles flying on their way out. Also, actually, correction, we can actually see the Israeli Iron Dome defense systems being shown here in action by an Iranian news agency, which is incredibly interesting to show that they actually proved that the Iranian that the Israelis had a response to the Iranian missiles coming in. We're going to be muting that for a minute, so that way we can just continue to show you all the footage. Um, but we can see here the missiles continuing to fly in. We can see an explosion right there near a car. We never saw that film. And we can also see the missiles that were hitting the airbase within uh, southern Israel near to the area of the Negev Desert just last night. We can also see them showing the parades and celebrations within the streets of Tehran uh, as the Israeli, oh, actually the Iranian missiles still continue to hit their targets within the area of southern Israel. From what we understand... And also, and also like Blue Cow Dog said in the live chat, he said, don't forget to mention that 50% of the missiles uh, failed on the launch pad. And that is true. 50% of all the missiles fired by Iran either failed on the launch pad or they puttered out halfway on their way uh, to their trip to Israel and they simply just fell out of the sky because they ran out of fuel and they just simply were duds. Uh, so a failure all the way around. So they launched a lot of stuff, but a good portion of it didn't even make it to Israel. Dang it, man. 
why she had to say that, dude. That was going to be the big shock that I was about to throw out because I have the news bulletin on that. And he just threw it out early. I was like, dang it. Uh, but anyways, I'm also going to be giving you all the statement from the uh, pretty much the general of the Iranian forces right here. We warn you that if the illegitimate Zionist regime will persist in its criminal activities, this time it will be faced with a heavier and more severe punishment we also warn the leaders of the United States that if the United States intervenes in support of the Zionist regime, all of America's bases and profits in the region in particular, all those bases and facilities that will be used to take action against Iran will be targeted by the Islamic Republic of Iran. And so we can once again see them issuing direct threats to the United States of America uh, while trying to conduct this war against the Israelis. It is showing that the Iranians are very clearly possibly trying to draw the United States into the conflict as they're trying to make a very pointed statement that they will attack and destroy U.S. bases if they have the chance, uh, if we even try and get involved on Israel's side. A very interesting statement by the Israeli, oh, well, actually the Iranian commander, but nevertheless, we also got to see the launch of Iranian missiles on in Western Iran from another clip, this one taken from an Iranian citizen uh, showing the launches that occurred. And here's the clip. And we see the launch right there as the missile is now taking off from its launch site and heading on its path towards Israel. Also see another missile being fired off close to the car. And then finally, like Matthew was saying just a second ago, we got the interesting news that apparently 50% of all Iranian cruise missiles and ballistic missiles fired from the territory of Iran last night, 50% uh, of them apparently either failed to fire or crashed before they even made it towards their targets. That does not mean that 50% of them were shot down by Western air support or Western air power. 50% of them didn't even make it into the air defense perimeters inside of Jordan, Western Iraq, and Israel to even be shot down, showing once again that apparently Iranian weaponry is incredibly poorly manufactured and has an incredibly high failure rate. Failure rates of this kind in weapons is uh, really unheard of, unless the weapons are complete duds, and even then, on a on a historical level, you don't even hear of failure rates that ever get this high. Even in the war in Ukraine, Russian artillery failure rates for the ammunition failing to explode sometimes get as high from recorded measures as up to around 10 to 15 percent, but that is considered massive by most means. 50% is, uh, is a group of weapons that is an absolute failure, a complete failure from every single regard, every single stretch of the imagination, and it is showing once again that the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran is incredibly short-strapped for any effective weapons or means to try and hit Israel. We also heard some other interesting statements being made by the Islamic Republic of Iran. We also got to hear that uh, the United States believes that the Iranians attempted to uh, conduct a highly destructive attack against the state of Israel because they did not give a 72-hour warning for its attack. As per usual customs in the modern day, you usually give 72 hours notice before you attack someone so that way they'll have a way to respond. They did not do that, so we, uh, so U.S. Uh, U.S. administration officials are saying that it was actually meant to be a highly destructive air campaign against the Israelis. We also heard that the Iranians are threatening even farther attacks today, although U.S. officials believe that that would not even be possible as Iranian weapons caches are mostly severely depleted after last night's attack. But Fightux News reported that Iran's Supreme National Security Council made a statement that if Israel wants to continue doing evil against Iran, it will receive a response at least 10 times greater than yesterday's attack, which means that the Israelis have absolutely nothing to be concerned about. They said 10 
10 times greater response. Like they fired off all their cruise missiles yesterday and 50 of them didn't even work. Uh, what are we going to have? Like a 60% failure rate this time? Like how, how much worse can it be? Man, you are going to see the true firepower of Wadia <laughs> to hear the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, it, it, it was a complete uh, mitigated failure. I mean, there's really no way about it. 99% of all air targets were shot down by a coalition and Israeli forces uh, as they were making it into Jordan and Israel last night. Very few Israeli missiles hit their targets. And that brings us even on further into Western Iraq, where we got to see a few extra missiles being fired over the territory of Iraq tonight, which is very interesting. We got to see that the Iranian missile attacks are still actually occurring in a sporadic amount, not as large as yesterday's mass wave attack, which ended up being defeated completely, but we did get to see two additional cruise missiles flying over the territory of Iraq just four hours ago. There goes one of them. We now hear the second one flying over right there, and you can actually see a glint of it in the camera. And one second, y'all. I'm actually notifying y'all in the chat of how far we've made it on the fundraiser. But with that, we can see that the uh, Iranians were continuing to fire missiles at Israel overnight. We were also able to get additional footage from the area of the capital of Jordan, Amman, of further missile interceptions that had been occurring over the city. Oof. Oof. We hear our cameraman here Mother imitating the sound that Roblox makes. Oof! <laughs> but we can see the air defense shooting down the missiles above. <laughs> And when you hear that the Iranian attack was so devastating and so scary that the sound of crickets could be heard throughout the background as it was so boring that even the crickets cannot wait uh, for the attack to end. They had to continue chirping. But we have been seeing that a lot of people have been talking about uh, Israeli military action being approved against Iran uh, and the U.S. advice to lay back and not do anything against the Islamic Republic of Iran for the attack that happened last night is going to be ignored by the Israeli government. We now know that it is inevitable, there is no doubt about it, that the Israelis will be conducting a large air campaign against Iran in some way, shape, or form. We just don't know the exact details yet, and we most likely will not know those details until the Israeli attack is underway. Uh, but a lot of people have been talking about whether the Israelis are in the right um, disregarding U.S. advice on what should be happening in the region, or whether they're making a big mistake by not listening to the United States warnings or advice uh, in continuing on with their armed response that will be coming here within the next 24 to 48 hours. A lot of people have been weighing in on this. And Matthew, what do you think? And most importantly, what is everyone else thinking? All right. So we asked the audience, what was everyone's thoughts about Israel saying that military action has been approved against Iran and that U.S. advice to de-escalate is being blatantly ignored uh, based on the information we've received thus far? It looks like 62% said Israel is making the right decision. 21% said Israel is making a big mistake. And only 4% said Israel waited too long and, we should, uh, and it should stop now. And also, by the way, I've seen a lot of questions coming in about why did Israel wait so long before they finally decided to approve some action, and how come they haven't taken that action just yet? And as far as we know, uh, Netanyahu had actually planned an immediate response, but he received a phone call from U.S. leadership, which caused him to call it off, and now he's rethought it, and now he's sought approval from the uh, War Advisory Board in Israel uh, to basically approve the plans before they actually take them into effect. So that's what we're being told at the moment. But for me personally, I think Israel is making the right decision because if Israel does not respond to Iran militarily, I think that will encourage many more attacks to follow. And anytime Iran starts getting feeling upset, they're going to launch an attack on Israel just like that because why wouldn't they? Because they have no fear of retaliation. So to me, it is imperative to respond militarily. But to me, it's also up to uh, Israel how exactly big they want the attack to be in the end. Uh, they can go all in or it could be proportional. Uh, but Enforcer, what say you?
I would have to say that, in my opinion, Israel is making the right decision. They are, in fact, the one that was attacked. Uh, and many people will know that our policy on countries that get attacked by other foreign countries is that whatever actions they deem appropriate in response to the attack that has occurred on them, the United States should largely support within, um, within reasonable realms. And I believe that this is a fairly uh, reasonable response that the Israelis are looking at is a retaliatory strike against Iran. When we talk about the war in Ukraine, just to give a direct comparison here, we usually say that anything that the Ukrainians uh, would want to do or seek to do to try and end this war quicker or to give them an upper hand in the conflict is all fair game. And as of today, the Israelis have said that the Iranian actions were an official declaration of war, and now the Israelis have said that they are at war with Iran. For that reason, I would believe that any actions, considering that they are now deeming this to be a full-scale war, a defensive war on Israel's end, uh, considering that the Iranians took the uh, initiative in attacking them yesterday, I would believe that any actions that Israel will take, regardless whether they're uh, very hostile and armed action against Iran, or whether they're just diplomatic actions against Iran if they wanted to, are completely understandable, and I would support them if I was the President of the United States uh, without question. It is not really a matter of me agreeing um, with the Israelis, and this is what a lot of people do not understand, is that it's not necessarily a matter of ideology. A lot of people think that it's a uh, it's a matter of ideology whether you support Iran, whether you support the Palestinians, or whether you support Israel. It really comes down in the region to who's the most friendly to the United States in the Western world. And out of the three, the Palestinians, the Iranians, and the Israelis, the Israelis are the most uh, most friendly out of the three. The Palestinians would want uh, Americans dead if they ever got the choice, and sometimes they have actually acted on that. And the Iranians would also want the United States dead if they could, and that's probably why they're continuing to work on nuclear uh, weapons development inside of Iran. It's just that way, one day, they can make that a, a dream come true. So out of the three... The Israelis are the only ones who do not want us dead and do not want to kill us, so I would make sure to support them in whatever actions they would want to take in the area, because considering that they are the only ones that we can get along with, it seems as though it would be appropriate to let them do what they wish against really not just Israel's enemies, but the United States' enemies as well, also the Western world's enemies as well, because be under no mistake, if you're inside of Europe, Iran and uh, a large amount of uh, the Palestinian government hates Europe as much as they hate the United States, especially the United Kingdom, for some, for some reason, but that actually takes a lot of historical explanation to get through. But with that, I hope I have addressed that fairly well, at least as best as I can. And speaking of those statements, we have been able to hear today that the Israeli government is uh, is saying that the attack was a declaration of war. They are st treating this as a full-on war against Israel by the Islamic Republic of Iran. Considering that they're saying that the Iranian actions were a declaration of war, this now means that the Israelis have declared war and they are now fighting a defensive war against the Islamic Republic of Iran. This operates on a very similar level to the war in Ukraine, as an official declaration of war was never given by the Russian Federation and still has not been given by the Russian Federation to the state of Ukraine, but nevertheless, it was a, a full-on invasion that was conducted by the Russian Federation, and even before that, the missile attack that occurred on Ukraine preceding the uh, ground attack by nearly two and a half hours was considered the beginning of the war by everyone in the Western world as well as Ukraine. Using that kind of common sense and logic that was applied to the Ukraine war, it is incredibly clear that the actions of Iran were a declaration of war against Israel last night and that the, Isra uh, that the Israelis are now fighting a defensive war against the Islamic Republic of Iran. We then heard that after that statement was made, the Israelis were planning on conducting an immediate attack against the Islamic Republic of Iran in retaliation for the missile strike that happened last night, but around 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, or 2 p.m. Eastern Time, we heard that apparently the mass attack had been called off after a, a phone call had been made uh, by President Netanyahu and also the President of the United States as well, according to an Israeli public broadcaster. Beyond that, we are hearing, once again, that the Israelis are coming up with a wide range of options for a retaliatory strike against the Islamic Republic of Iran, and according to a direct statement, Israeli military officials have submitted a wide range of options to respond to Iran's missile strike Saturday. Israeli uh, Defense Federation IDF spokesperson Peter Lerner told reporters early Monday morning in Tel Aviv. The IDF's response could be strike or no strike, according to Lerner, who noted there are a lot of different scenarios in between the two. The Israeli government will decide on the steps forward as early as Monday or within the coming days, Lerner said. So we know that they will most likely have some kind of an, uh, an answer to the Iranian attack by tomorrow, and we'll most likely see that carried out. 
We are understanding that while the attack was called off today, they are most likely considering some sort of armed action against the Iranians, most likely using the Israeli Air Force over the territory of Iraq and as well as maybe even southern Turkey, although that's highly unlikely, to conduct strikes and attacks against Islamic, of, uh, Islamic Republic of Iran sites that are within the territory of Iran. Moving on from that news, we were also able to get further information and footage of the attacks from last night and also the subsequent damage that was caused inside of Israel because of these attacks. Within the area of the Western Bank, we were able to see the Iron Dome and other air defense batteries uh, conducting interceptions over the city of Adora within the West Bank. Yo, yo. And when you see the Iranian uh, sure. Iron Dome missiles, we believe conducting counter battery fire or anti ballistic missile fire. I like I like the narration here. He went, yo, shit. <laughs> like, yo, yo, yo. <laughs> yo, 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 she. Yo! Lima bite! Boy, 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 boy. I wonder what yo means in uh their language. It literally means yo. <laughs> it's, it's it's literally like the American oh. version of yo. <laughs> A lot of activity up there in the sky, right above this home. Yo, yo, yo. A load of activity up there. All right, and then we got to Damn. hear the uh, the Tonka toy winding up. But with that, that's the end of the clip right there. And very interesting to see the interceptions. We were also able to see some remnants of an Iranian missile along the shore of the Dead Sea uh, that was pictured today. Here is the remnant of an Iranian ballistic missile that was fired into the area, shot down by Israeli air defenses, and the uh, large part of the fuselage uh, of the missile, or the body of the missile, ended up falling literally on the very shore of the, Red, of the Dead Sea, uh, giving us a little bit of a look at that Iranian missile and the components that it's made of. Very interesting to see. Moving on from that and that little bit of footage and evidence right there, we were also able to see further Iron Dome action happening over the city of Tel Aviv uh, later on in the day. We can actually see right down there that building that's kind of like uh, uh, has blue lights shining on it. That is actually the Israeli parliament building, funnily enough. So this is literally over the capital of Israel for the large part. <laughs> Wow, that was very non-Hebrew sounding. <laughs> if you heard that, man, do you think I would... Oh, man, fuck. <laughs> he, he, he did it, man. I was like, dang. Oh, oh man. Man, to be giggling like that, you gotta have some supreme confidence in those air defense systems to be laughing like that. Oh yeah, you do. We now hear the air raid sirens going off. Noticing that the air raid sirens are always a little bit late, it seems. Yeah, actually they are, because the counter-battery fire had been going on for quite some while um, before we saw uh, the air raid sirens go off. And with that... But that's that guy is like hysterical. But we can hear these guys, like you're saying, man, we can hear these guys having a really fun time during this whole attack last night. And luckily, they were able to have a fun time because there were very little casualties. We did hear of some deaths inside of Jordan from falling debris. But beyond that, things went fairly well, incredibly well, actually, compared to how they were actually supposed to go. Also, if y'all don't notice, while the Iranians said that they were going to be targeting Israeli military sites, doesn't everyone see that these missiles were actually targeted directly into the urban center of Tel Aviv? 
where the interceptions were occurring. I don't, I don't know if I'm the only one who has noticed this lately, because I haven't seen anyone bringing this up, but it appears that the Iranians probably were not attacking just the Israeli armed forces. They were attacking Israel as a whole last night if the attacks have been successful. They were most likely going to hit uh, probably high-density population areas within major cities, along with military targets as well. As these missiles are not coming down on the military base, they're coming down in the dead center of the city of Tel Aviv. But moving on from that little bit of news and on into our next bit, a little bit farther down and into the area of Ashdod, we also got to see uh, some interception failures of the Iron Dome system overnight, some of the few that did occur. occurring in the skies above the cameraman. And we also see one Iranian missile made it through and ended up striking somewhere inside of a populated civilian area, along with a second one and a third one as well. We can also see a fourth one right there. And now we can hear the CSX train rolling into town. That's not an air raid siren, that sounds like a train horn. Oh, that one made him go back inside real quick. Yeah, he was like, oh dang, <laughs> then he went inside. We still have heard of no civilian casualties within Israel uh, in incredibly large numbers. There have been some injuries, I believe, and maybe one or two fatalities uh, that were caused by st uh, human stampedes in some areas. But beyond that, things went wildly well. I cannot say that enough. It was really a miracle uh, how few casualties were had throughout the entirety of the Middle East from last night's attack. Meanwhile, we also got to see Israel shooting down Iranian drones close to the airbase that we saw getting stricken last night on air. This was actually conducted by the Israeli Air Force. So what you're seeing is the gun cam on uh, most likely an Israeli F-16 or an F-15 as it's firing off uh, short-range dogfighting missiles, most likely some, some form of the AIM-9 or the Python, uh, and shooting down these Shahed drones as they're entering Israeli and Jordanian airspace. Here is the footage. We can see one of the drones down. We can see them going for the next one. And also see one drone right there getting smacked by a missile and obliterated. Very impressive hits. Also impressive to think that they coordinated uh, coordinated these fighter jet attacks on these missiles and drones, uh, not just with themselves, but also with the U.S. and also the U.K. as well, and even sometimes the Jordanian uh, fighter jets as well. So it was like a huge uh, air defense operation with just the fighter jets alone. It really was. It was mad. It was a huge air response that happened last night, along with the ground air defense also having to coordinate their radar. The, because you have to remember this, man, because we've seen a lot of friendly fire happening in Russia, because not only are all of these air forces communicating with each other and their ground controllers uh, back in their home countries or at their home air bases, they're also having to communicate with the armies on the ground that are operating the air defenses, letting them know where these aircraft are at all times and what they are doing, so that way the air defense doesn't end up conducting any friendly fires accidentally. So it is a massive, uh, uh, like a huge feat of communication that happened last night amongst many different countries speaking completely different languages. The Israelis speak Hebrew. The Jordanians speak Arabic. The United States speaks English. And you have all of these different languages. And not only that, all of these different uh, air forces and ground forces all working together somehow to be able to pull off one of the most successful defenses of a nation from an air attack in modern times that has been seen. But we see the Shahed 136 right here. We see it's about to get obliterated. Right there. We see it turning into chunky bits. And we can also see another one right here. That actually is a Iranian cruise missile. But it looks like it just got obliterated so quickly the camera didn't even catch on. We still see another one getting hit. 
You can also see another cruise missile that was being targeted at the end of the clip, but the clip ends, but we all know how it ends. It's another destruction of another Iranian cruise missile by the Israeli Air Force. Meanwhile, we also got I'll be, this... I'll be, happy to, I'll be happy to see the day when Ukraine finally gets the F-16s and they can also have their jets going throughout the skies like that, shooting drones and also missiles coming in and shoot them down before they hit targets. Uh, that will be very impressive to see as well when they finally get those jets. That really will be, honestly. It, it will be something. It will be a sight to behold, especially with how competent we've seen the Israelis conducting their air defense last night. If the Ukrainians could get something similar as far as the Patriots and NASAMS batteries go, which is probably the closest thing they could get to the Israelis' Iron Dome and Patriot systems that they have, along with some F-16s, the Ukrainians could probably lock down their airspace as successfully as the Israelis were able to last night. And considering that the Iranian attack was was three times larger in size than the largest attack that has ever been conducted by the Russian Federation against Ukraine in the Ukraine war. We know that if the Ukrainians were able to get their supply of Patriot uh, batteries along with a larger amount of NASAMs and some F-16s, the skies over Ukraine would never have the air raid sirens sounding again as there wouldn't be any air targets that would make it in that far or end up hitting their targets on the ground. We also got to see that within the uh, southern area, well actually the northern area of the Negev desert we were able to get additional information about the air base uh, the air base that had been hit last night we were able to hear that out of the several missiles that ended up hitting the installation so, uh, two of them ended up hitting the northern runway, uh, which we have heard is apparently unused. One of these runways is unused, and I'm believing it's the one that's the farthest north. Uh, as the one farthest south appears to have a lot of uh, rubber streaks along the runway, possibly showing a high level of usage. And we've also seen new tarmac laid down on a part of it. So we're believing that this is the runway that they hit. But it was an unused runway, and then one missile ended up hitting nearby to a storage area where a C-130 Hercules was. And you can actually see... Uh, these right down here and ended up partially damaging one we don't know how severe that damage really is we just heard that a c-130 was damaged but nevertheless it is very good to hear that nothing major happened at the nevatim air base overnight we were able to see however uh that there was a report given about the damage of the air base uh which once again confirms the same thing i was saying we were also able to see uh a montage here of the strikes that were conducted and you can actually see, like, it's actually not these large dark spots that you're seeing on the map. That's actually cloud shadows. It's actually these small white blips, like this one right here, which is the most visible one, that pops up, showing where an missile impacted and exploded. So going off of that, we see that the damage to Nevatim Air Base was incredibly limited and was not that severe. The Israelis got out of that fairly easily. However, we did hear and see that apparently there was a large amount of missile action that also happened around the town of Elit last night, and we do know of several other missiles that ended up hitting in this area. Here is a clip of some of the interceptions that occurred over this major city last night. That's the end of that clip. And moving on from that, we were also able to see that a Saar 6 Corvette was intercepting air targets just to the south of the port of Yilet as well. Here's the clip. It's a very small one, but there is one of the incoming Iranian targets getting hit and blown away. Very successfully. Moving on from that little clip and on into our next one, we also got to hear some major news that apparently an electronic warfare system was present around the Elit region and greatly reduced the efficiency of any of the air defense systems that Israel had, which was what led to some of the breaches that occurred and the Iranian missiles ending up hitting um, the installations around the area. Uh, according to First Squawk on Twitter, uh, Ombre says they observed unprecedented levels of AIS interference off Elit and neighboring Aqaba from electronic warfare countermeasures. Uh, but very interesting note, and once again showing that the Israelis may be dealing with a bit of a larger issue. At the exact same time, we have also been able to hear that the Israelis have now suspended the further ground offensive that was going to be moving into the city of Rafa along the uh, Gaza-Egyptian border. You can see the Rafa crossing right here, and the city of Rafa as well. Israeli forces have now suspended this offensive as they're most likely going to be diverting their forces and preparing them for what may be coming ahead later on in the future. Um, we've also been hearing that within the north that there was a strike on Hezbollah forces that was once again conducted by Israel within the area of southern Lebanon. And really quickly, we're going to be waiting for that clip to load. And here's the clip. And there is the strike by the Israelis, a very effective one, of course.
I just don't think the Israelis know about small missiles. Is, has anyone informed them that there are smaller ones than the than the big boys? <laughs> Man, they said hit them with the brick, <laughs> and then they just hit them with the brick. But that's the end of that clip right there. But still showing that the Israelis are doing a great deal of work. Meanwhile, somehow, some way, the Russians are trying to get involved at least a little bit. I don't really know how they did it because we know that the Black Sea Fleet is not be uh, is not able to move its ships through the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles. So this ship is not from the Black Sea Fleet. It's apparently from another fleet somewhere in the Russian Federation. But the Russians have apparently moved a supersonic missile warship into the Mediterranean Sea. I've not really been able to get a lot of information on the specific name of the vessel or the specific class of the vessel because if we had that information, I might be able to tell you all more about the abilities of this Russian vessel. But at the moment, all we know is that it is some kind of a supersonic missile warship, uh, and it's been moved into the Mediterranean. Um, the Russians are supposedly maybe attempting to try and force the United States and Israel to the negotiating table, so that way they may protect the Iranians. This is once again why the war in Ukraine is being fought, so that way the Russians will not have the ability to do this so easily. By kicking the Black Sea Fleet out of Sevastopol, the Black Sea Fleet would be forced into other ports around Russia, which would be far, uh, much farther away from the Middle East itself, and thus make it a lot more difficult for Russia to be able to send a ship like this into the area in time to actually do anything that would be effective at forcing the United States hand or our allies hand within the Middle East. But a lot of people have been talking about this. And Matthew, what are people thinking about this and what are you thinking about it? All right. So after we learned today that Russia moves a supersonic missile warship into the Mediterranean Sea right after these attacks occurred by Iran on Israel, the big question is, is Russia going to defend Iran if Israel does launch this big attack uh, in retaliation? And it looks like 41% said Russia is simply trying to intimidate. 29% said Russia will likely defend Iran. And 22% said Russia will absolutely not uh, defend Iran. So on this one, it's a little bit of a close call. Uh, right now, you would think that Russia was completely tied up in Ukraine. And they simply couldn't move on from there and start trying to fight other fronts. But then again, you know, the invasion of Ukraine itself was pretty stupid to begin with. So I'm not going to rule out any stupid options that Russia might end up taking. It is possible that maybe they might try to defend Iran. It's probably unlikely, but it is a possibility. So I'm going to go with the 40%. I think Russia is simply trying to intimidate. They're also trying to create as much chaos and tensions as they can because they are hoping something breaks out in the Middle East because that will help them distract from their war in Ukraine. And in their minds, they're hoping to cut down support that might be going to Ukraine in the future. So I'm with the 40%. But Enforcer, what say you? I would have to say that I'm actually not that impressed uh, now that I know what vessel it is. Thank you so much to the viewer who brought up which vessel, vessel it is in the chat. And let me make sure I can get your name and recognize you because you really helped me out a lot. Uh, sadly, the chat is moving Aldo so Aldo um, it may be Aldo Schmidek, uh, because the ship is actually called, and let me make sure I get the name correct, the Marshal uh, Shaposhnikov, uh, if that is uh, Aldo Schmidek who put that in. Yeah, it is. It's him. All right, so we actually know the vessel that is being used, and I'm going to show it to you all. It is in a modified Udaloy class frigate, or a Udaloy class destroyer now reclassified as a frigate, uh, that is currently within the area. Now that I see this thing, I know that this is, in fact, less uh, has less firepower available to it than the Moskva, which was sunk and destroyed by uh, Ukrainian forces using a couple of kites and two bombs. They were able to destroy Russia's flagship of the Black Sea Fleet. So considering that this thing is less capable than the ship that was destroyed by two kites and a couple of bombs, I would have to believe that this is most likely not a major threat to anyone in the area. Usually whenever we hear about Russian actions that are taken in the area of the Eastern Mediterranean, trying to force America's hand or the West's hand into some kind of concessions, usually it's several vessels that are involved and also a bit of the Russian naval air arm or the Russian air force that is also involved on the part of, of the Russian Federation. Considering that this is only one Udaloy class uh, boat, I would call it, um, because I don't think this thing deserves the title of being called a ship. I would have to say that this isn't really that concerning to me. And if the Russian, if this is what the Russians are posing as their defense of Iran, that's that's cute. 
But the reality is, is that it doesn't really matter the firepower of the ship. It matters that there's a Russian presence in the area. And this single vessel can actually wreak a lot of havoc on a diplomatic level that would most likely lead the United States to saying, let's go to a bargaining table and let's see how we can come out of, out of this without firing a couple of shots at each other. That's most likely what would happen. But once again, we just heard it moved into the area. We do not know what kind of actions it's taking or what kind of approach it has to Western naval assets within the area. So at the moment... I would say they're most likely just trying to intimidate, but beyond that, I don't think they're going to be getting that far even on that level because it is just an Oodaloy, and Oodaloy isn't really that much to be concerned about. And let me actually see, uh, let's see here, uh, let's see here, there was a Navy tanker, and just, uh, a number of Black Sea Fleet ships. Uh, let's see, what fleet is this vessel in? Let's see, inactive service, but what fleet? Uh, and let's see here. <laughs> will it tell me i mean um let's see was part of the uh so so this vessel has actually been um it has broken free for the most part from the russian uh federation has been traveling around because the last time it was reported to be anywhere was on the 6th of march of 2024 and it was in doha qatar for dim decks 2024 so this thing has actually been traveling around a little bit uh, but also, interestingly enough, uh, in uh, February of 2018, the ship caught fire in Vladivostok. Uh, in 2016, the, uh, it received a refit to its weapon systems and sensors. In 2014, it was deployed to the international waters of Australia uh, as a part uh, of trying to pretty much uh, bully the Australians. In 2010, uh, it was... Uh, let's see, used to rescue the hijack tanker the MV Moscow University, uh, which they ended up killing all the pirates. Uh, and then let's see here. And then let's see, to start deployment. Um, so it doesn't really look like it's had that eventful of a life. Uh, rather than catching on fire in 2018, like most Russian ships do. Uh, so I would expect that this isn't that much of a threat or a concern to anyone in the region. I'm sure the U.S. Navy is laughing at this because we do have to remember that the U.S.S. Dwight D. Eisenhower is currently either on the southern end of the Suez Canal or has made it over the Suez Canal and is in the eastern Mediterranean. So if this ship is nearby, it's dealing with an entire carrier fleet. So I don't think that the United States is that concerned about it. I don't think anyone's that concerned about that ship. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that fairly well, at least in my opinion. And Matthew... I want to say that this fundraiser has been doing unbelievable. We have reached $2.7,000, and we are just $300 shy of that fundraiser goal. And I think it's time, y'all, to call up something that is a legendary order on this on this channel. And it is a general oh? order. Oh, order! Oh, order! Oh, order! General oh, order! A general order is being called into effect. If you are a member of the Lee Spring Army and consider yourself to be one, Make sure to support the friends of the IDF tonight and get this fundraiser over the top. I'm going to throw in a 20 to lead from the front. So I've thrown in 170 bucks tonight now to help out the friends of the Israeli Defense Forces. And I hope that you all join me alongside to get this fundraiser over the top and over that $3,000 goal. Once again, every bit of support helps. And I know that many people are used to us running uh, Ukraine war nonprofits here on this channel. But I do want to remind everyone that the Lee Spring Army is truly an international organization supporting Western interests not just in Ukraine, but around the entirety of the globe. We want to make sure that in um, in rare instances, considering that Ukraine is, of course, still our top priority, we want to make sure that in rare instances like these, at the outbreak of other wars that are threatening Western interests around the world, that we continue to show support to nations and allies of the West throughout the entirety of the world and make sure that they know that the United States and the rest of the Western world is on their side as they continue to face down the axis of evil along with us. So, I hope that we were able to get over that $3,000 goal here just in a matter of moments. And it looks like we actually are. I think we are about to pass right over it. Hey, we in goal! Let's go! Let's go! No! Let's go! We did Dino, it again! Dino, Igor! The Lee Spring Army is truly invincible and legendary. And I gotta say, a huge shout out to each and every single one of y'all again tonight uh, for supporting friends of the IDF and helping them out uh, because they do massive work and efforts helping out the Israeli Defense Forces and humanitarian measures, not providing them with bulletproof vests or helmets or anything like that. That's more of the Israeli government. But medical efforts they help out massively with. And I gotta say that it is absolutely amazing um, to see that everyone was once again able to support another fundraiser and send it right over the goal. Absolutely incredible, and a huge shout-out to all of y'all once again. And while we're giving that huge shout-out, Matthew, I understand that we have a lot of top donors tonight that have really helped out. Could we get a call-out for all of them? 
Yes, we can. And it is a pretty lengthy list. So bear with me here while we go through it. And our biggest donation of the night thus far is from Howell Road. He throws in a $333 donation, and hey! Hal is always a heavy hitter on all the fundraisers, and huge shout-out to Hal for that. And also, real quick, while I'm calling these out, I'm actually taking care of some bots as well. They just left. Get out. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> our next one goes to BC Skyman, who put in a $200 donation, the second largest of the night. And a huge shout-out to BC for that generosity as well. Then we have a $150 from The Enforcer, some guy hey! who hangs around the channel quite a bit. And then we have a 150 from GTO Joe 04, as well as a 125 from Mom Cats Mind Candy, and a 100 from Peter BC Skyman yet again, and then a 100 from Don Edwards Say What Snow White, and then we have a 54 from Paramecium 13, Old Man Gib, Neil Vizinot, Andy L, Steve Watkins at work, Dragoon 50, Fighting Finn, Matt Cheer, and also Say What. And a huge shout out to everyone who's donated tonight. And uh, tonight is not our usual fundraiser. We typically fundraise for Ukraine, but even the LSA has come through on this one as well, which is a testament to the LSA's commitment for fundraising for democracies around the world. So we appreciate the generosity a whole lot. It does mean a lot to us that we can hit these goals every single night, and we thank you all very much for that. But Enforcer, what say you? And I got to say a huge thank you to everyone so much once again. I got to say that thanks to this fundraiser tonight, the friends of the IDF will be able to continue to support and help out Israeli forces that will be dealing with a large conflict within the Middle East that is once again facing down one of these nations that we would consider to be a part of an axis of evil around the world. The United States and the Lee Spring Army and the rest of the Western world as a whole will continue to face down these uh, rivals and enemies uh, side by side as a great union of peoples who continue to see the evils of the world and try and fight against it and raise up the banners of liberty and freedom around the world. It's great to know that so many people were able to help out this fundraiser tonight. Of course, considering that it's not on Ukraine or a Ukrainian fundraiser, we're still greatly appreciative to all of y'all because it once again shows that the Lee Spring Army supports uh, the right cause throughout the entirety of the world and will be making sure to keep everyone in line, not just the Russians, but Iran. And not only will the Russians now know the name of the Lee Spring Army, now the Iranians will uh, know the name of the Lee Spring Army as well and the kind of amazing and incredible people who make up its ranks and so thank you to all of you all so much once again and before we move on huge shout out to the uh top donors of the night i want to make sure that we uh answer a couple of questions before we move on into the ukraine war news because we also have a large amount of news that has been going on there as well all right and moving into our question here we have one from crazy canuck who says, Enforcer, if Israel does start a war with Iran and the U.S. is dragged in, would it be conceivable that President Zelensky allows NATO to use its airfields to attack Iran if it came to it? I would have to say um, that they probably would not allow NATO to use Ukrainian airfields because that would usually be considered to be by the Russians a provocation and would probably lead to a direct full-on world war uh, with the Western world against the Russian Federation or the Russian Federation against the Western world. So I would have a feeling that that most likely would not be supported. They most likely would use uh, airfields that actually would realistically be closer and outside of an active war zone like Romania or Bulgaria or even Turkey as Turkey is a NATO country and directly borders the Islamic Republic of Iran, a much Suit a much more suitable uh, nation to use uh, to conduct air operations against Iran. Or we could use the air uh, the airfields of Saudi Arabia, or we could also use other airfields within the region. Also our mobile airfields, uh, the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, the USS Baton, and also um, the USS Gerald R. Ford if it's rotated back into the region again like it was back on October 7th. Um, but with that, I hope that does address that well, and we are on to the next one. All right, and our next question goes to Boss, who says, I crunched the numbers and found that the Russians have lost $113 billion worth of equipment in Ukraine, and how much longer do you think the Russians can continue like that? We've actually crunched the numbers, and that is actually a completely accurate number crunching. And I got to say that from what we understand, the Russians most likely are going to run out of equipment towards the latter end of this year or the very early part of next year. Uh, we've seen that a lot of people have been uh, looking at the satellite pictures shown of Russian supply yards throughout the Federation, and they are starting to run wildly low on uh, armor equipment, and armor is still, while largely inefficient these days, it is still the major part of conducting any kind of an armed offensive in an ongoing war. And if the Russians run out of that, that means the war in Ukraine is over. They're no longer able to conduct any kind of offensive 
operations in Ukraine, and that means that now it's in the Ukrainians' ballpark, even if they have a limited number of armor, to be able to conduct offensives of their own and eventually start pushing the Russians back out. Uh, so going off of that, we understand that the Russians probably will not be able to hold on all too much longer. And also on top of that, that massive cost that you're talking about ties into the economic side of things in the Russian Federation as they have been expending insurmountable amounts of raw cash to try and keep the nation running and to try and keep their war effort going. And it's money that Russia simply does not have and there's no way for them to create a spending deficit that would be healthy for the Russian Federation going on into the future. And for that reason, they will mostly collapse by the latter end of this year or the beginning of next year for that as well. Uh, we also understand that on top of that, there are a lot of domestic situations that are uh, devolving inside of Russia as well. For example, the massive floods that are still occurring near the area of Orcs in uh, Orenburg. And we're also hearing about the continued, um, I guess you could say, collapse of Russian infrastructure throughout the entirety of the Russian Federation. So going off of that, we do know that the Russians will probably survive till the end of this year or the beginning of next year, but by then they will truly be uh, stretched to their limit and will have run completely out of resources and equipment and funds to be able to keep the war in Ukraine going. So with that, I hope we were able to address that incredibly well. Mandy, I believe that was the last question, if I'm correct. We actually have one more to go, oh, and this one is going to go to... This one's going to go to a fiery goats who says, can anyone answer what are the chances of Israel actually attacking Iran and a fiery goats that actually comes down to pretty much speculation uh, at this point. In my opinion, I think it's a 100% certainty that Israel is going to respond militarily in some capacity to Iran for the attack that Iran conducted on Israel's soil. Uh, I think that's pretty much a certainty at this point. The thing to me that is undecided and also the Israeli government has said this as well it's a 50-50 chance. It could be that Israel goes all in on Iran and absolutely glasses the place. That's a one possibility. And the other possibility is it could be a proportional response where Israel uses somewhat of a restraint on their uh, usage of force. Uh, and in my opinion, those options are 50-50. So that's the thing currently that's up in the air. But certainly a response of some sort is coming soon. But Enforcer, what say you? I would have to say that in my opinion, I believe there is certainly a large armed response that will be occurring from Israel. We do have to remember that this conflict is going to look a lot different than the land war we've been seeing in Ukraine because there's such a large geographical distance in between the two warring parties. Israel and Iran at its shortest distance is at least 600 miles apart. That is a road trip. And let me make sure to put this into perspective because I have to put this into perspective. That is a road trip from Paris to Berlin in distance that is a huge area to cover really honestly it's almost all the way to Poznan in Poland so it's an incredibly far range distance I'm trying to actually find actually no no better yet it is a it is a flight from Paris to Vienna across Europe that is how big the distance is in between Israel and Iran and when you put that into perspective this is not going to be a war like in Ukraine where we see these large massive ground battles occurring this is going to be a war entirely fought over the skies of the Middle East in between Israel and Iran, over the skies of Jordan, Iraq, and Syria. Going off of that, I would have to say that the Israelis will most likely be conducting massive air campaigns inside of Iran, trying to conduct precise strikes against Iranian military targets and Iranian military equipment, and also trying to assassinate and execute uh, members of the Iranian government, most likely to include the president of Iran, the armed force, well, the chief of the armed forces of Iran, the chief of staff of Iran, um, the heads or generals of each uh, armed branch of the armed forces of Iran, the leaders of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps that have just been recently promoted due to openings in those job positions, among many others. We will be expecting those kinds of attacks to occur, as that does appear to be the most likely route of Israeli response, at least in my opinion, but we will have to wait and see. If the Israelis do not uh, respond in that way, there really is no other way for them to respond. There is no way for them to conduct a conventional ground war in Iran, as they do not have the ability to conduct a multiple hundred if not several thousand mile long supply line from Israel all the way into the Persian Gulf or the Gulf of Oman to try and land a landing force inside the area of Iran we would also know that Israeli armed forces would not be able to fly their aircraft into Iran because they most likely would not be able to soften up the air defense once again without massive Israeli air campaigns being conducted over the airspace of Iran destroying Iranian ground uh, battery ground air defense sites and also other Iranian uh, military sites so overall that's most likely what we be expecting and i hope that does answer that question incredibly well now with that in mind i thank everyone so much once again for watching 
this segment. We're moving on into the Ukraine war now, news now, but I want to make sure that we give a proper segue here because if you're just joining this stream, which many people are, there's 10.2 thousand people here at the moment. Actually, now there's 10.3. This is the end of the Iran-Israel uh, war news segment. We're going to be moving on to the Ukraine war news segment now and talking about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. So if you want to know all of the happenings and events that have happened so far inside of the Iran-Israel war, make sure to rewind to the first 10 minutes of the stream and start watching from there, and you'll be able to hear all of the events and actions that have occurred over the past few hours. But moving on from that and up into the Ukraine war, we have been able to hear that the flooding inside the orsk orenburg area has continued to be incredibly severe and has no chance of subsiding here soon. It appears that the reservoir is still emptying itself further upstream, and this is leading to the Russians getting to observe some nice, beautiful flooding that is occurring through the entire region. Man, that, that right flooding is getting absolutely horrific, man. What is that floating away? It looks, it looks like it. Oh. Why or shot head? I do too. Пиранья, аккурать, пиранья, пиранья, лебедю на связь. Блядь, why are we hearing the attack drones, блядь? Звоните, кто в пиранье есть. Эй, why do we hear the stuka, блядь? Сорвала гигантскую, короче, плавун. Сейчас это все пойдет в сторону города. Половина моста оторвала. It looks like giant bogs that are floating away, honestly, Matthew. It's like it's like made of like twigs and sticks and stuff. So the flooding is so bad um, that apparently it's just washing away the bogs. That's terrible. Terrible stuff. And it is showing that the flooding is quite severe, considering that it's uprooting massive bogs. Moving on from that and on to Ukraine, we were also able to hear the air defense report that the Ukrainians were able to shoot down a whopping 10 Shahed 136 drones. Well, you can see that the Ukrainians walked so that way the Israelis could run. Because the, <laughs> because the Ukrainians have been largely figuring out how to deal with Shahed drones without any of the abilities that the Iranian air defense showed that they had last night. And you have to consider that there is a massive disparity in between Ukrainian ground air defense and Israeli ground air defense because the, the, the Ukrainians intercepted 10 Shaheds overnight, and this is considered a fairly good day. The Israelis intercepted around 300 to 400 Shaheds just yesterday, and that was considered to be not that big of a deal and not even the beginning of the war by many. While, and, and that's always something that I find very weird, I just have to say this, is that some people who oh, just like are just dead on supporting Ukraine, they'll look at these 10 Shaheds that were shot down and are like, oh, the atrocities of the Russian Federation, and it is an atrocity. And then Iran can launch 400 of these things in one night directly at Israel, all of them get shot down, and then and then people who support Ukraine and call 10 Shahed drones, once again a continuation of an act of war by the Russians, then they'll look at 400 drones being launched by Iran, they'll go, eh, that's not really the beginning of a war, I don't know what the hell these people are talking about, I'm like, what? I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, what? where's the lack of logic here? But anyways... Still, great to see that the Ukrainians were able to shoot down 10 Shahed 136 drones. Moving on from that, we were able to get huge and breaking news from Germany that they're going to be giving an entire second Patriot missile system to the Ukrainians, which is big news. This was according to Twitter, and I don't know why the computer is running so slow. Let me go over here to Twitter. Here we go. This will be quicker. So... According to the uh, the president of Ukraine's Twitter account, it said, I had an important, uh, important and productive call uh, with Schultz. I am grateful to the chancellor for the decision to deliver an additional Patriot air defense system to Ukraine, as well as air defense missiles for existing systems. Thank you, Olaf Schultz, for your leadership. This is a genuine show of support for Ukraine in a critical moment. I urge all other uh, partner country leaders to follow suit. We also discussed the upcoming Ukraine Recovery Conference in Berlin. I also briefed the chancellor on the preparations for the inaugural peace summit in Switzerland in June. I'm grateful to the chancellor for his willingness to make the summit a great success. So it does appear that I'm glad I'm glad to see I'm glad to see that they got sent that Patriot because you know Germany is still withholding the Taurus missiles they are not sending those to Ukraine so uh, Ukraine's kind of missing out on that front um and I, but I will say though like one Patriot battery I, I know Ukraine needs all the air defense they can get but just one battery is is a little bit disappointing to me because you know it seems like maybe if they could have sent maybe two or three uh, I know they're expensive. I know that, but it seems like one is a little bit of like sort of like appeasement. Like you know, here you go. Like, are you happy with that? It doesn't seem like it's really like sufficient for what they really need. 
I would have to say, man, I, I, I would have to say, in my opinion, one Patriot, that is pretty freaking good. I mean, that is a $1 billion air defense system being sent. So I'd, I'd say it's not bad. They do need a lot more, but that's certainly not a bad start for the Germans in particular, uh, because that is a huge amount of support. That is a billion dollars in a single system right there. That's impressive, and at least to that's me. That's true. That's and, true. But but how, how, how large of a radius does the Patriot missile system actually defend? About 120 miles in a, like a, in a, radius oh it's not bad that's not bad they need they need probably i think the the number was they needed six or seven of those things to actually cover like what they need to cover um but one it's a good start i will admit yes that's true and also to put that into perspective 120 miles let's just say it'll reach 120 will cover a circle this big inside of ukraine that is a pretty big area of air defense that could be provided by a single Patriot missile when you put that into the circumference. Better yet, I actually think Deep State will show us that. If we go over here to the weapons, uh, let me see here if we can get ourselves a Ozuzana. Oh, but let's see here. Let me see if I can find a Patriot. Storm Shadow. Here we go. Patriot. We want that pack too. Boom, baby! And that's what one Pack 2 Patriot can cover right there. This whopping area. This massive area. Boom, baby! Look at that. You can take one Patriot and pretty much defend the entire skies over the western front lines with a single Patriot battery. Get seven of those, you are able to defend literally the entire airspace of Ukraine. That is actually pretty impressive, that's impressive. when you think about it. And when you, really, when you really, really think about it. That really is. When we move this down to Israel. Let's see if I can. One Patriot can really cover the entirety of the nation of Israel, which is pretty impressive. And then the Israelis have, I think, six of those. So they're doing incredibly well with the air defense down there. But moving on from that, and all well, how many how many Patriots does Ukraine already have? I think they have, I think, uh, three, um, four, including the new one. Um, but I think they have three, and one of them has been um, halfway destroyed because it ended up getting hit. Unfortunately, it was the Wandering Patriot battery that actually got hit up in Kharkiv. And from what we understand, half of the launchers were destroyed. Uh, so only half of the launchers are operational. So they really only have about two and a half operational batteries at the moment of the Patriot. That's still a pretty good number, and I'm sure they'll appreciate that new one. But we do need to send some more, I will say. And I'm confident that in the future, I think we'll be seeing some more aid going to Ukraine. We've got some promising news out today uh, that uh, some things are in the work in the U.S. Congress. So hopefully it goes through. And I'll agree, 100%. And moving on from that and on to our location unknowns, we were able to get a couple. We were able to see an AMX-132 being used by the Ukrainians. And we can hear the same music being played. Well, you can see the missile right here. And it says, Rowdy Company, yay! Oh, but here's what's really impressive when it fires. Watch the watch how hard this thing pulls. Watch. It gets fired straight up. And then it gets straight off into the horizon. It's like, oh my god. That thing actually turns on a dime when it launches. Look at this. Straight up. Literally a 90 degree turn. That is wild for a weapon to be able to pull off. Uh, but with that, I gotta say... That it is nice to see that they were able to, once again, use an AIM-132 the way they want to. And moving on from that and into our next clip, we were also able to see that some Russian dugouts just keep getting hit. We got to see this from a Russian POV. If it loads. There we go. He's a little warm. A little toasty, perhaps. Oh, the video's loading. Oh, oh no. It's buffering. Why is this doing this? What what is going on here? You can see the toasting continuing. That looks like a nice fire. Oh, he freaked out about something. He's like, oh, let's <laughs> see what it was. Oh, I know what it was. It was ammo cooking off in those ammo cans that were on fire right in front of his idiot face. <laughs> like the, one of them blew up in a cook off and he went, oh, but <laughs> 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 oh, you're crazy! Oh, you're crazy!
<laughs> and then he doesn't even walk away or anything. He just looks back at it while they're starting to cook like popcorn. What an idiot. Oh, you didn't know the ammo was in the fire the whole time? I don't know, dude. I looked at this fire, and as soon as I like took a second look at it, I was like, oh, there's burning ammo boxes in the fire. No wonder oh. it's blowing up. Like, that just makes sense, doesn't it? But this guy Wait a minute. Are, are they using the ammo boxes for kindling? Yeah, no, no, they're using it for they cover. They put the ammo in the box? <laughs> yeah, the ammo's still in the box. What? Using it for cover. <laughs> dude, they said... This will protect me from a Ukrainian drone attack because if it hits, it's just going to blow the whole place to F up. It's like, yeah, I mean, what an idiot. Man, the Russians really went and grabbed the ammo boxes. They grabbed the ammo boxes like, we need some firewood, Bliot. They threw them on there with the ammo in it. Oh, my God. Oh, no, no. This is this is a, this is a uh, Russian position that got hit by a drone and caught on fire. So instead of them using it for firewood, what it is is that the position is burning down, but the giant ammo box is filled with ammo that they use to make the roof of their position are exploding <laughs> from the fire. So, Man, so it it's makes basically it even, firewood in my book. Dude, it makes it even worse because it means that if the Ukrainian drone didn't kill them, their, the roof of their dugout's going to kill them because it's literally made of bombs. That's just stupid. I mean, that's really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh man, but anyways, moving on from that into our next clip, we also got to see some Ukrainian infantry in training with their BTR-80s and M113s. There's a BTR-80 with its uh, beautiful gun, and we can also see this Ukrainian soldier here using his AK-74 like a legend. We can also see them driving around in an M113. We can also see this guy hopping out of a BTR-80. Uh, and also in this last clip, we can see them running around through some tire piles. Uh, but moving on from that and into our next clip, we also got to see some T-64s of the Ukrainian army in training. Look at them. Aren't they beautiful? If they load. Uh, we're getting this in by fax machine tonight, folks. Sorry about that. But beyond that, very nice to see them in training and doing their thing. It's, it's wonderful. But with that, we're now moving on from that little bit of news and we're now moving on into our last bit of location unknown news which is the russian cashier report and ooh, and hopefully miss disa if you're in the oh. chat and i know you're probably in the chat and let me make, let me check yes miss disa you're in the chat make sure to give me the typo correction because i know that you sent it but sadly i cannot pull up the discord while we're on air so make sure to type it in because i know that there's a typo i just forgot which ones are the typo but 12 bobcat oh wait here we go thank you miss Disa legend putting in the comment over here to correct the numbers uh the uavs are 34 and matt uh, is very go ahead uh the total is a 34 drone shot down uh instead of 48 like it says here in the number and also that is the only typo to be had but matthew what are you saying matt is happy for what Matt is very pleased by the 12 Bobcats today. That's one of the highest numbers I've seen in a while. A very big catch by the Ukrainian forces, I got to say, indeed. And the other losses are looking fantastic as well. And I got to say that it is very impressive. And Matt is very happy. Make no mistake. 12 Bobcats get steers in a day. That's, that's pretty good news. And not only that, 890 Russian forces were wounded and killed. We also got to hear of 20 armored personnel carriers being destroyed, along with 60 supply trucks. Five main battle tanks, 34 artillery pieces, four, oh, actually 34 drones, uh, along with the artillery pieces, one MLRS, one cruise missile, two anti-aircraft warfare systems, and the 12 Bobcat skid, skid steers. Overall, some impre incredibly impressive numbers. And of course, amazing to hear that those kinds of losses were inflicted by Ukrainian forces today. Meanwhile, in the area of the Northeast, we were able to see that some Russians dropped some bombs on some Russians that had taken over the house of some other Russians. So they had some pretty nice flooring in that house. Man, they did. And there's a there's one of the bombs that apparently did not explode. It's just sitting there in the rubble. <laughs> it's like this. Do you know the Russian? He's about to not, he's about to push the doorbell that's on the side of this thing and get blown up. But with that, that's the end of the clip right there, and very nice to see. Moving on from that and down into the Kremena area, where we also got to see the Forests of Hell. And the reason why I called them this is because it's being compared to another forest famously known a while ago. The picture at the top... Oh, ooh, wait a minute, we might be experiencing some lag. Oh, God! Oh! Oh! Okay, we're not. All right, I think we're good. Matthew, are you here? Are you here? Are you alive? Yes, I'm still here. Okay, good, good, good. So... 
What we're looking at here in the top picture is a picture of the Battle of Cremena, or really the Cremena Forest, as it looks today after a heavy amount of shelling has been occurring here for months on end. Then at the bottom picture in black and white, we're actually looking at the exact same thing, but in France, uh, near the area of Verdun, uh, which really it looks almost identical or exactly the same. Uh, it's pretty wild to see that because... When you really look at that, war just does not really change with how it is over the past hundred years. We're really in the same era of warfare that World War I was in. Um, but nevertheless, once again showing the devastation of the Cremona Forest. Moving on from that and down into the area of Bachmut, we were able to uh, also see that apparently the loaves are getting upgraded massively. We were able to see a both. Here is the war loaf. Brony capsule. Oh, oh, we flatlined. Oh, um... Oh man, I'm so sorry everyone, we're getting lag attacked. Y'all know how it is, it happens from here to there. One second, I'm actually going to fix this really quickly, so hang on everyone. Hello? Are we back? Man, we're back from the dead because the Enforcer will ensure that the Leaf Spring Army will never die. We, I found a fix, Matthew, to the whole DDoS attack deal that we have to fight every once in a while. I'm not going to say how we fix it, but I found a way to really just quickly throw that crap away straight into the trash. But anyways, getting back to Borla. Capsule, Brony Automobile. Prokach. <laughs> you know, Matthew, I know who drives this thing. Who is that? Scooby Doo? Aww, oh, man. Aww, oh, oh. man. My date went terribly. They saw my whip and they freaked out. Aww, oh, man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dang. Are we lagging still? Yeah. Oh, my God. We're still lagging. We're just going to keep on trucking forward. Like, half of your sentence got cut out. But we're just going to keep trucking on. You know what I mean? Also, Enforcer, <laughs> hold, hold, down, hold down the force for just a second. I'm going to go do some checking on something real quick, and I'll be right back. So give me, like, three minutes, and uh, you can keep going ahead. All right. So we're going to be showing the Warlow. Oh. And with that, that's the end of the clip. And we're now going to be moving on from that and into the next one near to the area of me of getting Klishkivka, where we got to see that some foreign volunteers were forcing the Russians out with grenades, or really forcing them into this pieces. Stop. Here's the clip. Not till you come out. Now see him taking the grenade Granada. and popping it on in. Now see them laying down some heat, popping off some more grenades. Tell him to come out. Выходи, сука! Выходи живой останешься, блядь! Выходи, Питер! Обещаем, давай! We hear them continuing to encourage the Russians to come out. They're not coming out, and so they needed them instead. And that's the end of the clip, but still, nice to see. Moving on from that and a little bit further down from the Bachman area and into the area of Yena uh, Kieve, we were able to see that a new counter-battery system deployed by the Russians was destroyed today at a nice value of $200 million a pop. There it is, right there on the edge of that field, and it's about to be gone. It's about to disappear. Very see? expensive losses. It's not, oh, look at him go. Oh, man, that thing's going. And, and Matthew, I think you fixed it. What did, did you I fix do? it? What did you do, Matthew? What was the secret? I had, I had to go outside and take care of a little fellow real quick. Oh! Aw, man. <laughs> Could I, I? I don't want rum and coke. I want coke and fin. <laughs> but anyway, so you can see right here, the uh, counter-battery system and the crew moving around on it. But seriously speaking, though, all I did is literally go check our connection and see if everything was, like, good with the router and also the modem. And it looks like everything was good. I checked the connections and stuff. So I don't know what's going on, but maybe that fixed it. Maybe so. I think it actually did because we're not seeing any conne uh, connection interruptions anymore. But, ooh, right there, there was that hit on the counter battery system. They didn't see that counter battery coming in, did they? Oh. 
Oh, and another head coming in close nearby in the other field in front of the vehicle. Also, by the way, I have to give a huge shout out to everyone who's joined the Lee Spring Army today. We are incredibly close to 191,000 subscribers. We are just about 60 away. Uh, so if you are new to the channel and do enjoy it, make sure to subscribe as you may be the 191st uh, thousandth subscriber on the channel. Uh, but we see the counter battery radar system continuing to be hit and heavily destroyed. Aw, man. But with that, that's the end of the clip, and nice to see the counter-battery radar being destroyed. Meanwhile, in the area of Ivtivka, near to Krasnarivka, we were able to see some Russians playing catch. <laughs> Rock music ensues. Uh, but we can see them here targeting the Russian. He's right down there, and he's running through that trench. And uh, he's like, no, I don't want the catch. And the Ukrainian's like, oh, come on, play catch. <laughs> and he's like, no, please, no, don't do it, bleed. And the drone's like, I'm going to get you. I'm going to tickle your neck. He's like, no, nah, don't do it. Oh, blee it. Oh, blee it. Oh, and he caught. Unfortunate for him, but very fortunate for the 47th Magura. Throw up that coal sign. <laughs> but beyond that, that's the end of that clip right there. Very nice to see. Moving on from that and on into our next clip, we were also able to see uh, the fate of that retreating T-90M we saw a while ago. Let me show you all this. Y'all remember this T-90? Y'all will remember it when y'all see this clip right here. The T-90 that was driving away on fire on the edge of that clip. So we actually found out what had happened. The gunner and the commander were both killed by a Ukrainian FPV drone that hit the side of the tank and ended up spraying hot molten shrapnel throughout the inside of the turret compartment, killing both the gunner and the commander. The only person who survived in that entire tank crew was the driver. And we can see him taking a picture after the attack right there and that's oh. the only survivor from that tank that. so i guess you could say that the t90m is not the best tank out there moving on from that we also got to see u.s equipment in ukrainian hands but due to time constraints we won't be able to show that because it's about 10 minutes long but moving on from that and down into the area of volodar we were able to see a drone hitting a russian and this was an incredibly interesting one because this was actually filmed by a Russian. I'm not going to say anything during the clip because it is a comedy in its own right that we are not going to interrupt during its first playthrough, but we are going to have a breakdown of it after we play the entire clip. Oh. Very angry bee. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> dude, you Damn. missed the best part, man. Look at the drone. It flies over all of them. And you see Vadim over there on the, on the, like the cliff over here, like on kind of like the embankment. And watch, <laughs> this guy yells up, Vadim! <laughs> Vadim gets hit by the drone. It's like it's a Looney Dudes cartoon. Who <laughs> <laughs> oh damn dude this Jeez. guy this guy said Bliet. he was in the wrong place at the wrong time man this guy said bliet like he was um like like he was already disappointed before it blew up he said but and then he went bliet and then it hit him like listen bliet <laughs> 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 Dude, he was so disappointed before the before the guy had even hit the ground. He just went, oh, bleh. It's, it's like, oh, man. It's like he must have seen this a good amount. He made that sound like it happens quite a bit. Like, oh, it's just another one. They took another one down this time. Bleh. <laughs> Dude, he's like, he's like, hey, everyone watch out for the drones. And then it flies over. <gasps> there it is. And then he looks over. But him. Bleh. <laughs> he's like, damn it, another one. Who <laughs> 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 oh my god he sounded so defeated there wasn't even like a sound of panic in his voice it's literally like it just happened again <laughs> like another russian got hit and taken out oh my lord and everyone's like vadim is gone vadim is gone but we have to watch this again <laughs> oh my Bleh. <laughs> Dude, that's going to be my reaction whenever we get another hit piece made on that stuff. Just going to go, oh, bleh. But anyways, moving on from that. <laughs> 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 moving on from that down to the area of Rapone, we were also able to see the Russian losses. 
The loss of a Euro 4320 that was covered in a complete cub cage. Actually, it's a Typhoon armored uh, vehicle, but it's just an armored cage put on the back of a Ural. Uh, and we also got to see the back of it as well. Destroyed very nicely. Moving on from that out of Robotne, it's now time for us to move on up to Kiev to cover the speech from President Volodymyr Zelensky. Let me see if they actually put it on his website. Uh, if he didn't, I'm going to have to file a complaint with the Office of the President of Ukraine. It looks like they have put it on the website. And so, without further ado, here is the speech. Check it out. The speech. The speech you will be given and nothing more, please. But anyways. За минулу ніч вдалося збити 10 шахедів з 10 застосованих росіянами. Я дякую усім нашим воїнам мобільних вогневих груп та усім іншим оборонцям неба. Загалом за тиждень російські терористи використали проти України вже майже 130 шахедів. На щастя, більшість з них нам вдалося збити. Також були застосовані більш ніж 80 російських ракет та майже 700 керованих авіабомб. На жаль, з цим значно складніше. І це тільки один тиждень. Сьогодні знов ракети та дрони Дніпро і Нікополь, Покровськ та інші міста Донеччини, Харківщина, Херсонщина, Сумщина. Є поранені, є, на жаль, загиблі. Мої співчуття усім, хто втратив рідних. Росія використовує кожен день, кожен тиждень, кожен місяць, щоб завдати значної шкоди. На жаль, допомога Україні – Досі обмежена, а російська держава досі має доступ до критичних компонентів, які необхідні для виробництва ракет і дронів. Кожній ракеті, що завдає ударів по Україні, щонайменше десятки компонентів електроніки, чіпів, які постачаються від компаній з інших країн та завозяться через територію сусідів Росії. У шахедах також компоненти вироблені у вільному світі. Все це має бути припинено і може бути припинено і потурання терору, і змога терористів шукати собі спільників по світу. І сам російський терор, всі його прояви. Сучасна авіація доводить свою ефективність, сучасні системи ППО здатні давати захист життю. Зараз на Близькому Сході це було продемонстровано, коли авіація і ППО збивали іранські ракети та Шахеди, які були спрямовані проти Ізраїлю. Увесь світ бачить, що таке справжній захист. Бачить, що це можливо. І весь світ побачив, що Ізраїль в цьому захисті був не наодинці. Загрозу у небі знищували і союзники. І коли Україна говорить союзникам, що єдність дає найкращий захист, ефективність цього вони вже самі добре знають. Знають і забезпечують. І коли Україна каже, що союзникам не можна заплющувати очі на російські ракети і дрони, це означає, що треба діяти. І діяти сильно. Не риторикою захищається небо. Не думками обмежується виробництво ракет і дронів для терору. І те, що санкції проти Росії все ще обходять, і те, що ми в Україні місяцями чекаємо на життєво важливий пакет підтримки, те, що ми досі очікуємо голосування в Конгресі, свідчить про те, що так само місяцями наростає самовпевненість терористів. Не можна більше втрачати час. Потрібно реально захищати життя всюди, де є йому терористична загроза. Потрібно робити все, щоб зло та війни не розповзалися світом, ані в Європі, ані на Близькому Сході. Ані будь-де і ще. Я дякую всім, хто це розуміє. Кожен, хто може дати захист життю, повинен це робити. Кожен, хто може обмежити потенціал терору, повинен це робити. І Україна, і Близький Схід, і всі інші частини світу однаково заслуговують на справедливий та надійний мир. Ще одне. Фронт. Ситуація на фронті у час такої гарячої війни завжди складна. Але цими днями особливо на донецьких напрямках важче. І я дякую кожній бригаді, кожному солдату і командиру, які роблять все, щоб захистити наші позиції, та які знищують окупантів. За цей тиждень особливо заслуговують на вдячність 58-ма окрема мотопіхотна бригада, 68-ма окрема єгерська бригада, 148-ма окрема артилерійська бригада 
ДШВ, її воїни незмінно ефективно діють. І на тижні був день бригади у 148-ї. Я вітаю вас, хлопці. Я дякую вам. Дякую також 55-й окремій артилерійській бригаді Запорізька Січ. Молодці. Варто відзначити і воїнів ГУР, підрозділи Кракен і Артан та 9-й департамент ГУР. Пишаюся вами. Слава кожному і кожній, хто робить все, щоб Україна захистила себе від російського терору. Слава усім, хто робить нашу державу міцнішим. Всім у світі, хто допомагає. Я дякую. Слава Україні! And then Ram Slava. And Hiram Slava. Oh dang, I forgot to turn you down. Oh my god, dude, they went to everyone's damn hearing. Uh but with that, that is the I end of this. Blew it all out. Man, you had to, man. You had to you had to put it all out there, man. You know what I mean? But beyond that, it is time for us to move on into the next segment of the stream. But before we do, I still have to give a massive thanks to everyone tonight who was able to fundraise for the Friends of the IDF. We were able to reach $3.6,000 raised in this fundraiser. An unbelievable amount. And truly incredible to know the Lee Spring Army can shift from focus to focus, strength to strength, as quickly as it was able to rise from really nothing um, in, into the amazing community that it is. And we're now able to do incredible things around the world, not just in Ukraine, but even in other areas like the Middle East as well. I thank everyone so much for doing that. And if people want to continue to support the fundraiser, be my guest. Really, do be my guest. I would love to see the fundraiser get even higher. But of course, we have passed the goal, so technically everyone can sit back and relax for a little bit because there's going to be no real pressure going on from here. But with that, it is time for us to get on into the next part of this stream where we of course shout out the top donors in between the last segment and this one and we also answer as many live chats as we can and so matthew take it away all right so moving into our last segment here we have one last poll to address and the question says do you think israel is trying to unfairly drag the u.s into a war or is a response warranted it looks like 49 percent said israel simply wants to respond 33% said Israel wants to drag the U.S. into it, and 9% said that's one reason, but not the main reason. And in my opinion, I really don't think Israel is necessarily trying to uh, basically be objective uh, to get the USA in this war. I don't think that's the case. I think, the, uh, I think Israel simply wants to respond to the escalation that Iran did on its country, and it simply is trying to level the playing field. That's what it's trying to do at this point. And I don't think that the narrative that Israel is trying to um, drag us all down is a fair one. Uh, but that's just me. But Enforcer, what say you? If that is uh, if uh, if that is the rhetoric that people are trying to use is that Israel is trying to drag us into a greater war, then you can use really that exact same rhetoric with Ukraine by saying that by them trying to defend their country from the Russian Federation instead of simply let, uh, rolling over and letting the Russians do whatever they want to them, they're trying to drag the United States into a greater war and ruin the entire Western world. Which both of those statements would be completely unfair and untrue statements. These two countries are fighting legitimate defensive wars uh, against powers that wish them harm and wish the Western world harm. Uh, for that reason, I believe that Israel wanting to respond is simply a matter of response uh, to an attack that was prompted by Iran last night against Israel, and they are now going to be responding in turn. And a lot of people are saying... Well, Iran didn't start the war. The Israelis started it by blowing up the IRGC commanders in Damascus. But the thing is, is that they wouldn't have had to blow up those commanders if they weren't supporting Hamas and Hezbollah that have been attacking Israel since October 7th. So, in reality, Iran started it. Um, and also, another thing is that just because, and, and I'd, I'd find it very weird, and I do have to say this, because I see a very small amount of viewers uh, on this channel who have been pro-Ukraine through and through, but they use completely different playbooks on what's justified in between Ukraine and Russia and what's justified in between Israel and Iran. If Wagner was the one that was attacking Ukraine, which it was, and it was involved in Ukraine uh, ever since around 2017 up to the present day, people would say, see, that's a proxy group of the Russian government. It may not be officially the Russian Federation, but it is aligned with the Russian Federation. The Russian Federation calls the shots with this organization. Therefore, it is a part of the Russian Federation and therefore is direct Russian military action in Ukraine. And that would be an incredibly fair statement. But then when people look at Hamas and Hezbollah, which are trained and equipped with Iranian weapons and also Iranian funding, 
then people go, actually, those groups are not Iranian at all and have absolutely no attachment to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps or the Iranian government at all, which are literally the exact same statements, but two completely different conclusions to them based off of what countries are at play. And that's something that I largely veer away from. If I'm using one rule book in Ukraine, it's going to be the same rule book used in the Middle East. And that rule book says as follows, based off of what our analysis was on Ukraine. Israel was attacked by Hamas and Hezbollah on October 7th. Before that, no attacks had been happening. The slate was clean, and then they went in and they killed around 1,500 to 2,000 Israeli citizens overnight. Then the Israelis responded to that by striking those forces inside of the Gaza Strip, as well as within the West Bank and Southern Lebanon, for several months on end. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps continued to support and fund those forces, although the Israelis had already told them that that was a bad idea. Then the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps also attacked U.S. forces within the region as well and ended up killing three service members. Then, as an, um, as an accumulation of all of this, the Israelis decided to strike more so at the head of this conflict that they had been fighting for months on end and kill the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps commanders that were running and funding Hezbollah and Hamas. Then when they do that, Iran gets pissed off that the Israelis are striking more directly at Iran, which is funding and calling the shots of this entire war that's been going on since October 7th, and then they want to act like they're the innocent victims of, of Israeli aggression. That is the way that it went. A lot of people want to say that it went some other way. And that is something that I got to say, it's just, it's just not so. Like, you can't sit there and say, oh, you know, it only started when when Israel struck the IRGC. They wouldn't have done that if the IRGC hadn't been funding and supporting terrorist groups attacking Israel for months. They would have never had a reason to do that. That's like saying, oh, well, you know, Ukraine started the war um, because, you know, I mean, like, they exist. Uh, so naturally, it's wrong for Ukraine to exist, and they shouldn't have their land. It's it's a completely stupid statement, like, when you, when you put it back into Ukrainian perspective, because you may as well be arguing for a Russian victory at that point if we're using the same kind of logic and the same kind of rules on both sides. And on top of that, we're also cheering for anti-Western forces to win. It doesn't matter whether you like the Israelis or whether you want them to be in Israel or not. It really matters who is for us and who is against us. And the Palestinians want America dead. The Iranians want America dead. The Israelis are kind of indifferent to the United States, but are pretty much okay with us helping them out. And they're pretty much okay with helping us out in instances as well. So it's a somewhat mutual, mutual relationship with us and Israel as compared to Palestine and Iran. And Iran, of course, having in the past, ended up conducting attacks and killing U.S. service members. So I wouldn't exactly take them as the biggest friends of America. Oh, wait a minute, hang on. Our stream got flatlined again. Oh, God. Oh. Can you hear me, Matthew? I can still hear you now. Oh, thank the Lord. I think we may have gotten through it. Um, but I see. I hope people see what I'm saying here, because... When I apply logic, it's it's logical. It's not going to be illogical and based on emotions, trying to make a different scenario, well, the same scenario fit a different a conclusion just because I don't like a country or support them. Um, it's, it's the same answer and the same conclusion in both scenarios. Uh, so I would have to say that the Israelis are just wanting to respond in the area and they are completely deserving to do so. And so with that, I hope that does address that incredibly well. And we are on to the questions, I believe. All right, and also, by the way, big shout out to Joseph M. Seeker, who threw in a $100 donation to the fundraiser and brought us up to $3,576 raised in total of our $3,000 goal. So a huge shout out to everyone uh, one, once again brr, uh, for, for raising that goal and getting up there to that goal. So we appreciate it very much. And with that, we're moving on to our questions. And our first one is going to go to Chronically Alien, who says, Matt, how many Patriots does Poland have? I would say that the Patriots that Poland has, I actually do not know. Let's go pull up Polish Armed Forces Equipment. And let's check it out. List of equipment for the Polish Land Forces. So let's scroll down and let's find their Patriots. And let's see here. They have no Patriots. They will never have a Patriot. Uh, the best thing, the closest thing that uh, the Polish you're going to have to a Patriot is the Naru, which is a form of the CAM, um, which is a missile that was developed by the United Kingdom. Uh, so overall, um, they have something similar, but they're going to have about 23 of those batteries uh, by 2027. Uh, and so with that, 
I hope that does address that well. And once again, showing that uh, the Ukrainians are heavily lacking on air defense because Poland is a country, I believe, landmass wise, that's smaller than Ukraine, but they're planning on having 23 heavy hitting, large, uh, large caliber anti-air batteries, while the Ukrainians, I believe, only have three right now to cover their entire country. And the Israelis have six to cover an area that is incredibly minute compared to the size of Ukraine. Uh, also, really quickly, I want to go to the true size map. So let me let me go get this because this is such an interesting and informative map in reality when you really look at it. So let me go over here and let me grab Israel. So here we go. Here's Israel. We're going to drag this up to Ukraine. So this is how big uh, Israel is in comparison to Ukraine. So this is really... You can put this directly up to the western area of Ukraine, and it's really just the size of a small slither of western Ukraine. It's not that big of a country, but it has six Patriot batteries inside of it, and it kind of gives you an idea of how massive Ukraine is and how small Israel really is, and they have six batteries to cover that. Poland, and let me make sure to get Poland up here. Poland, in direct comparison to Israel, uh, to Ukraine, is smaller. I would say at least by a third uh, at a minimum, maybe even half. And they're going to have 23 air defense batteries to defend their skies. Going off of that, it seems a little odd that Ukraine only has three. I think that we should certainly help them to get more, at least seven, which seems to be a bare minimum in reality when we're looking at real air defense figures and numbers, uh, because it would certainly help out Ukraine a great deal. And then, to put that into comparison for a lot of our American viewers, I'll do the same thing with Israel and, uh, and Poland over here in the United States. Let me take Israel now in red over here to this part of the world and you can actually see that it is about the size of less than a third of West Virginia uh, or to put it in between two cities it's the distance in between Indianapolis and Nashville that is the farthest it goes in length and then in width at its widest point it looks like it would be the distance in between Huntsville Alabama and Chattanooga Tennessee at its widest point so not an incredibly large country by any means, but still has around six Patriot air defense batteries that it can count on. Um, with Poland, and let me get Poland over here, and let's drag Poland over. Poland is about the size of Colorado. Um, so when you put that into perspective, 23 batteries, air defense batteries to cover a state the size of Colorado. The, the Ukrainians only have three air defense batteries right now to cover an incredibly large landmass, and that is a very small number. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that live chat incredibly well. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and our next live chat question is going to go to Toten VT, who says, uh, do you think Israel will prioritize Iranian nuclear sites in their upcoming strikes? I certainly think they will. Um, at least that's what I would expect, because that would probably be the first thing that they would want to destroy is the possibility of Iran ever possessing or using nuclear weapons. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that incredibly well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And we have a question from Duncan VR, who says, If Enforcer was president right now and decided to attack Iran, uh, how would he decide to invade and what would be the first targets? And yo, yo, yo. Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> Let's say, fast forward, <laughs> it's 2040. And I'm now the president of the United States and this situation is the one that's in front of me. I would largely like to avoid putting ground forces in Iran. That would be something that I think would be a bad idea due to the geography and terrain of the country. It would probably be a very slow and grueling kind of a war. Uh, even compared to Afghanistan, Iran is brutal as far as its geography goes. It has a large amount of mountain ranges inside of it. Terrain is terrible to fight over. So I'd largely want to avoid fighting in it. Um, what I would want to do, however, is I'd want to use the U.S. Air Force as well as the U.S. Navy air, uh, air Arm, to conduct airstrikes inside of the territory of Iran and destroy any military installations, ground air defense sites, the Air Force, as well as any naval bases along the coast, and also their nuclear developments programs. If the Iranians did not yield then, I would then start to order direct, uh, pretty much assassinations to be conducted against the Iranian government itself. The president of Iran would be the first to go, uh, and, be, you know, the, the president would be the first to go, so that way um, we could work our way down instead of working our way up. Because the president is the one being directly touched, and people would be not too, uh, not too afraid to keep everything going. They'd just go, oh, it's unfortunate this guy died, but we'll keep it running. 
But killing the president of Iran first and then going after the armed forces, the commanders of the armed forces second, would make sure to instill fear in the next up-and-coming president of Iran. So that way they'll know if you take that spot, we're going to end up getting you too. So it would be best to start negotiating with the United States instead of getting yourself killed too. Who, who likes to be a martyr? Not that many people. Uh, so this is the way I would most likely go about it if I was to conduct strikes against Iran. But at the moment, unless if U.S. forces were injured and killed in the area... I would take a step back and I would just largely leave this to the Israelis to deal with. I think they're going to deal with it in a way that will leave the United States fairly satisfied. And I would like to see what they're about to do before the United States takes any action. If the Israelis take too reserved of a seat, um, which I think they would probably end up doing right now because of the U.S. demands, then I would see about conducting these kinds of strikes inside of Iran. Um, but at the moment... If the Israelis do all of that and the United States doesn't directly have to do it on its own, then the Israelis should do it. They ought to be fine doing it. Uh, and so I hope that does address that well, at least in my opinion. Um, but once again, you always, we always have to remember that you don't want to go immediately to glassing people off the bat uh, because you kind of lose all of your abilities to uh, have them hop off the train before we get to that point. We want to make sure that there is a natural route of escalation. For example, let the Israelis deal with them first. And then if the Israelis don't deal with them well enough, then we get involved, then we conduct that plan, and then we see if the Iranians will give concessions. And if somehow we end up destroying the Iranian armed forces from the air, as well as the Iranian government from the skies, and there still is no yield to be had from Iran, then I believe we should conduct a ground invasion. But that is the last, really, the last move, really the last uh, resort uh, for U.S. policy, or really U.S. action against Iran in the area. And I think that would probably be the most severe, and hopefully we wouldn't have to get to that point, but if we had to, then we would have to. It's just inevitable at that point. Um, but with that, I hope that does address that well, and we are on to the next one. All right, and moving on to our next live chat question. We now have one from Scott Mensing, who says, any word on the U.S. air tanker that made the Mayday call, uh, any word at all? From what we understand, it made the Mayday call simply because the Iranian drones were now airborne. It squawked so that way it could evacuate the airspace. That's what we understand. We did not hear of any damage being caused to that tanker uh, or the loss of the tanker and the crew. So from what we understand, it sustained no damage, and it was just the crew uh, calling a squawk so that way it could evacuate the airspace of Iraq and start heading into friendly airspace inside of Saudi Arabia and other areas throughout the Middle East. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that well, at least from what I know. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and the next one goes to Defender Marcia LSA, who says, what's Jordan's position on all of this, and how are their air defenses? Uh, Jordan's air defenses are fairly competent and also has a large amount of bolstering from Western countries like the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, Jordan is a very interesting country, and a lot of people view the Middle East as this one. Uh, this is a very big problem around the world, is that a lot of people don't look at the world as varied and different as it really is, because every country is actually different. But a lot of people look at the Middle East as this monogamous, uh, monogamous hulk, or homogenous hulk, of Islamic peoples that are all hating Israel, uh, and are all on the exact same page, where if one of them fires shots, everyone thinks that everyone's going to hop on board and start killing Israelis tomorrow. Uh, the reality is incredibly different, um, especially in the modern world. Jordan is probably one of the most pro-Western countries within the region, um, even uh, head of Israel possibly, because it does allow for the basing of U.S. and British forces within the area. It also has some fairly good relations with the British and United States governments. Uh, Jordan, however, is not necessarily a big fan of the way that the Israelis have treated Palestinians uh, within the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and have called, uh, called the Israelis uh, inhuman for the way that they've treated the uh, Palestinians. But at the same time, we can also see that on an actual government governmental or diplomatic level, they're on not too bad terms with the Israelis as they did open up their skies to the Israeli Air Force overnight so that way the Israelis, along with the Jordanian Air Force and Jordanian ground defenses, could shoot down all of the incoming air targets that were heading over the country and on into Israel. So it's a little bit of a difficult thing to explain. Jordan is a little bit unfriendly on an ideological level because Jordan is a, a, is a large majority Islamic country and the Israelis are a large majority Jewish country. And so there is a decent amount of ideological clash to be had there. But on a diplomatic level, they're actually on fairly good terms and on a friendly level. Considering that both countries are largely Western aligned, they understand that while there is ideological differences, getting along in the long term is probably the most beneficial for the two parties. Uh, so with that, I hope that does address that 
uh, fairly well, at least from what I know, um, because it's a it's a very, very different kind of a country than what a lot of people would believe. Same with Syria, Iraq, Qatar, Bahrain, the UAE, Oman, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, and all of the other countries, including Lebanon, Middle East. They're all actually very different from each other. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that well. And we are on to the next one. All right, and I see a question in the live chat from one of our moderators, the Watcher, who says, what other countries have the Iron Dome? Uh, no other countries, from what I understand, have the Iron Dome outside of Israel. Uh, it was actually uh, joint developed by Rafael Advanced Defense Systems and Israel Aerospace Industries, but beyond that, the Israelis are the only ones to operate and field the Iron Dome system inside of Israel. There are no other countries that uh, use them, but the United States does have one Iron Dome battery that we use for testing purposes uh, out in the western part of the United States. And so with that, I hope we were able to address that incredibly well, and with that, we are on to the next one all right and our next super or uh, not a super chat but our next live chat question is going to go to tom xman who says oh, why wouldn't israel have fought back during the attack yesterday because now it's basically over um, Iran, well, Israel wouldn't have fought back yesterday because it takes several days usually to come up with an attack plan and then to respond. Uh, that's why we see, because with that kind of a question, we could say, well, why in the world did the United States respond to the three U dead U.S. service members at Tower 52? Because by the time we did, which was around five days later, it was all over. Uh, the thing is, is that it takes a while to plan air campaigns because there's a lot of planning to be involved, finding out what targets are to be stricken, what aircraft are, be, uh, are to be used, who they are to coordinate coordinate uh, their efforts with on the ground uh, and everything else in between, along with the command and control uh, centers also being apprised of the situation and being able to uh, change things at, at will if they need to during the middle of the engagement. It takes several days planning wise. So that's why the Israelis did not strike back last night. This is not as easy as it looks in the movies. Uh, the movies make it look like when someone's under attack, the president just goes, get them boys. And then they have like this whole entire plan figured out r literally as soon as he just says, get them boys or they just start blowing people up. Um, it's not like that in real life. It actually takes a lot of planning. Go get them, Jack. Let's go get them. Oh, well, well, I, I want an ice cream on my desk. I don't want the Ayatollah on a stack. <laughs> Bomb the shit out of him. But beyond that, um, <laughs> that's, that's, I don't think that's a that well. That was so stupid to say. But beyond that... Um, who <laughs> me? No, 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 me, me. <laughs> just sit there and say, I want that. I want damn, ice cream. I was about to say, damn, man. No, I was sitting there thinking, how stupid did that sound for me, man? I said, I want an ice cream right now, and I want that until on the steak, bomb the shit out. Like I was like, that sounded goofy as hell. But anyways, with that, I hope that does. Address that. Well, I'm cracking myself up over that. That was really stupid. But anyways, uh, I hope that does address. That. <laughs> Thank you so much once again for asking a great question. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and our next live chat question goes to Abof770, who says, what defensive capabilities does Iran actually have? Uh, and I'm a dual citizen of America and Israel, and I'm just wondering when Israel decides how to strike back, what can Iran do to stop it besides sending missiles back? Uh, and great question, Iranian Armed Forces Equipment. Let's go and take a look at their air defenses, because the air defense is going to be their first line of defense in any upcoming uh, Israeli attack. So list of equipment of the Iranian army and oh my god who made these flags dude these things look like rugs oh. <laughs> they, they look like rugs yeah. Ew. Uh, it looks like a area rug and man that's a cool not a quality rug that's yeah. bad <laughs> <laughs> dude look at this cheap little helmet they put in the middle of the dude these people are terrible at design oh my lord oh dude it's terrible all the way through Oh, okay, so... Ah. Oh, look, we're moving on to the next picture. It's an SPG-9. Cool. Um, But anyways, now we got to get down to the actual equipment. It's freaking out. Man, I'm tweaking over here on that. That was just dog ugly. Uh, But let's see here. We got to get down to that air defense. Let's see, where is the air defense at? Missiles. Any... What's air defense doing? Man, what the air defense do? Oh, wait a minute. Do they not... Wait a minute, main article. So... Okay, so they don't have a lot. Uh, they, and they don't even put actual numbers. They just put plus signs. They say there's a lot or a little of something. So, <laughs> so the, they have they have a quadruple plus of the gush guns. 
Uh, they have a quadruple plus of the Samovat, which appears to be a different version. It's actually a twin Orlikon gun, most likely provided by the Germans way back in the day. They then have the uh, the triple plus of the Sa'ir 100mm anti-aircraft guns, which we've actually seen used in Ukraine, um, not in air defense. They also have a triple plus of the Mezbo. What the hell is this? What the hell? Dude, it's what four Gush guns hell? put together. Oh, yeah, and also he's sitting there with like a control panel or a unit or something, controlling it with a joystick or something. Am I seeing that right? Yes, he is controlling it with like a giant PlayStation tile. <laughs> Are you supposed to sit underneath the barrels like that to control it? What the hell? Most likely not. That's how it gets not. Um, but th dude, I cannot say how stupid this thing is. It is literally four gush guns strapped together into one system. So it's not it's not increasing the accuracy or anything. It's just quadrupling the firepower of a single gush gun in a single centralized area. So completely useless, really, because a single gush gun would still do the same job that these four would. This is this is cartoonish levels of stupid. But anyways, let me move on from that. They then have a double plus of the Shilkas, which are fairly dated. And then they also have triple plus of the ZSU-57-2. <laughs> Man, you know triple plus in playing. They got a few of those. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this is sad. So, so as far as the air defense artillery goes, this will be a... A non-issue for the Israeli Air Force. They won't even have to really worry about this at all. Even in, even if they're using just conventional aircraft like the F-16, these are not going to be posing any problems for them. Anyways, in the missile defense category, things are a little different. Um, they do have some rapiers, which are a older form of air defense system provided by the West. We're not even sure they have any active ammunition for these because that probably would have expired. The propellant would be bad by now in these missiles. But they still have them, technically. They have 30 of them. Those might be able to pose some issues, but not really that much. They also have the Hertz 9. That, that, that speaks for itself. Uh, anyway, it has a range of 11 kilometers, so not that far. Uh, this one has a range of 16 kilometers, which is the Tor system that has actually been provided by the Russians. Um, so, very interesting. We've seen that the Tors have done kind of okay in Ukraine a little bit, but they ended up getting destroyed a lot. They have 29 of them. They then have 200 of these goofy Yazakra 3s. Uh, looks like they're Hurst 9s, but with two more extra missiles and mounted on a trailer. Uh, it has a very small range of 16 kilometers, so a very close-in system. Not that effective against modern air targets. The Israelis would be able to destroy these at standoff uh, distances, including these as well. Uh, all of the short-range air defense systems are practically useless against the Israeli Air Force and what they're going to be doing against Iran. Meanwhile, they have some Hawks. Oh, God. They got <laughs> they, they got the Hawks, Matthew. Oh, look at that. I guess they get to test them out here shortly and see how uh, how good they work. We will get to see if the Ukrainians will really be looking forward to them or not. They also have the Kub right here. Fairly ancient system as well. Uh, they also have the Mesrid, uh, or the Mersad, which is an updated hawk. You can see it right here. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, that's just a hawk painted tan. <laughs> dude, 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 the Iranian commander said, it will fly straighter if we paint it tan like the desert. And they went, yeah. And so they painted it tan, and then they put... Or something on the front of it. I don't know how to speak Arabic. But anyways, we also got to see the comment too. Um, holy moly. Man, they had to put an infographic on Microsoft Paint on the side of this thing. Uh, but, oh my lord, Man, is that said, the generator? Uh, knock, knock. <laughs> I think so. That's crazy, man. They said, knock, knock, come in too. <laughs> Man, dude, this is terrible. Dude, that engine, man, is literally just in the open. There's not even anything covering it. It's just in the wide open sitting out there. That's so janky. That is janky. That lag, man, is killing me, man, because I can't tell when you start talking. Yeah, it's stop killing me too, man. It's, 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 it's killing me really badly. We also have this thing, which looks like it's fake. This dude, are you shitting me? This is one of those airport tugs that they use to drag the planes around. Why does it look so wrong? Like the whole like like equipment this thing is on, it just looks wrong. Like the design of it. Hold up, Matthew. Hold up. I gotta go pull up one of these airport tug things, one of the older ones. Oh my heavens! It really is, Matthew. I gotta find it. It it is one of those things. It really is. I'm not even kidding, man. Like I'm. I gotta find it. I gotta. I'm. I'm trying to like filibuster while I find this thing. 
But, oh man, this is the closest one I'm going to be able to find. It's just a four-wheeled version. But it'll do. It'll do. Yeah, it'll do. All right. So that thing is is this thing just weaponized. Yeah, I can, I can kind of see that, actually. That's, that's actually pretty close to it. They just put missiles on top of the thing. But it's a little bit different. So, wait a minute. I need to know, like, the speed at which this thing can travel. Because if it travels at slower speeds, we're on the money. Um, so, operational range, 105 kilometers. That is... Wait, I'm sorry. That's, I believe, the missile. Um, dude, well, there's is... the platform right there. It says, Zo, Zo, Zo something wheeled TEL. Where do you see that? The bottom of the specifications over there on the launch platform. No way. No, I mean, that's a transport erector launcher. So it's pretty much just like a missile carrier. Uh, so... Let's see. So we don't know the actual hull of the vehicle, what it's made of, uh, but we it's got to be somewhere on here. The system is also designed specifically for U.S. fighters, sure. Uh, let's see. Let's see, it's part of our... Yeah, man, they're not telling us what this thing is based off of, like what the vehicle below it is. Uh, you've got to be kidding me. They're, they're like, they're playing with us here, man, because that thing is an airport tug used to drag around planes and they put some missiles on top of it. They're not telling me any different because it's literally designed for that. That's what it looks like it's designed for. Uh, but sadly, we will not be able to find that out for sure. So we're going to have to go back to the missile defense systems. Uh, these all do not really have that much range. They're all still fairly short range. Then they have the long range systems, which we don't even really get a lot of information about. Uh, they have the Corad 15, which looks like their version of a Patriot. It supposedly has a range of 100 to 120 kilometers. So these may actually pose issues for Israeli air forces, but these are also probably going to be the first things that the Israeli air force targets and destroys. Uh, they also have some S 200s and S 300s, typical Russian fare, uh, which they'd also probably be able to shoot down as well. Then supposedly the Bavera 373 could shoot even farther than a Patriot at 300 kilometers, which I'm not believing at all. Uh, but supposedly they have a system that can do that, but I'm doubting it. Um, so with that, I hope that does address that well. And also, uh, thank you for being on this channel, being an American-Israeli dual citizen, and asking us uh, for our opinion on things, because I think the Iranian air defense is probably not going to fare too well against the Israelis, especially considering how comically bad the uh, attack against Israel was conducted yesterday. But with that, I hope that does address that well, and we are on to the next one. All right, and moving on to our next live chat question. This time we have one from Anani Mouse, who says, These drone and missile attacks on Israel and Ukraine have me thinking. Uh, the U.S. is a large country, and what does the U.S. have in place as its air defense? And do we have an Iron Dome-like system? Uh, our Iron Dome are the Patriots and the Thads, which are uh, large caliber air defense systems, uh, but we have so many of them and enough ammunition that we can protect most of the United States uh, with those Patriots. So yes, we do have a version of that. It's just far larger in caliber and also far larger in scale. Uh, so with that, I hope that does address that well. And we are on to the third to last question of the night. And this one is going to Mad Machine, who says, Do you think that Israel will take the chance to destroy or at least drastically set back uh, Iran's nuclear missile program? I actually think that that's probably the first thing that they're going to be going for if they attack anything uh, after they attack the air defense, because that will always be the priority is clearing out the skies over Iran. Once they clear them out, they're going to be going for those nuclear weapons development facilities as soon as possible. I believe that will be probably one of their first targets because it doesn't matter if Iran continues attacks in the future. They most likely will, no matter what uh, Israel does to them. As long as they don't have nuclear weapons, that will be the thing that Israel really does care about. And so with that, I hope that does address that well. And we are on to the second to last question of the night. And this one goes to Kit English, who says, Enforcer Matt, did Iran take a USA ship today? And no, they did not take a United States ship today. But uh, yesterday or the other day before that, they did take over a Portuguese flagged vessel, uh, which is Israeli linked. It's a cargo vessel. Uh, the IRGC went and boarded that vessel using a helicopter. The guys repelled out of it and uh, took the ship over and took the Fil uh, Filipino sailors as hostages. Uh, and we haven't really heard anything about that ever since. So I'm assuming the Iranians have that ship in their custody and it has not been released just yet because we haven't heard anything about it. 
Um, but it's kind of odd how that just really disappeared off of uh, news coverage completely, and we haven't heard anything else. I guess all the other attacks kind of overshadowed the uh, hijacking of that vessel, uh, but it still is on the lam. Uh, but Enforcer, what say you? And I, Matthew actually addressed that perfectly. I have not heard of an American vessel being intercepted and uh, hijacked today by the Iranians, but we did hear of that Portuguese-flagged Israeli-owned vessel from yesterday. And so with that, I hope that does address that well. And Matthew, it is that time of the night for the lucky last question. And so... Who is the lucky last person to throw in the lucky last question of the night? And that viewer is a non. Uh, actually, it's not a non. It's Melinda Grifford Vaughn, who says, What's the future of Ukraine? And their general has stated problems on the Eastern Front and a dire need of weapons and ammunition. And U.S. aid is stalled and lackluster response to allies is troubling. Uh, from what we understand, the future of Ukraine is uh, in kind of a little bit of a precarious stretch at the moment. Uh, I hate to say that because, of course, I like to be an optimist, but the reality is, is that Ukraine is lacking greatly on support from the United States, and support from the United States was the most uh, important support they were getting. It wasn't a pissing contest until it was when America stopped supporting Ukraine, and then we found out um, that America was really a large part of floating um, the war in Ukraine, and it, it really is. There's no doubt about that. The Europeans do a great amount of help, but it really is the bulk of the United States' uh, overwhelming support and ability to supply raw materials and equipment that really helped out Ukraine. Uh, at the moment, we understand that there will be a vote held on the Ukraine aid bill here very soon, I believe at the end of this week. Uh, and it sounds as though it may be promising. It looks like it actually will be passed through the House and the Senate, uh, which will be incredibly good to hear. Uh, and then, of course, it'll be rubber stamped by the office of the president, as we know that the support is heavily supported by the president at the moment. And then that will move forward to Ukraine. So while it's a difficult situation at the moment, we're having a feeling that this is going to be a short time of tumult in Ukraine's armed forces history in the war, and it'll probably be overcome by the massive wave of U.S. support that will be coming back around again here probably within the next few weeks. Uh, uh, so with that, I hope that does address that well, because while it's a little tough right now, there is a silver lining, and the skies are going to clear up ahead of us. Uh, and so with that, I hope I was able to address that well, and it is time for us to round out tonight's stream. And what a stream it's been again tonight. I have to thank everyone so much once again for watching this channel and greatly enjoying this stream. It's been truly incredible. We have passed 191,000 subscribers tonight uh, with all of y'all here. So we have gone from 190,000 to 191,000. Uh, I got to thank everyone who joined us today and the 700 people who joined the Lee Spring Army tonight. We are incredibly appreciative of all of y'all being here and hope to have y'all here well on into the future as we continue to cover news from around the world inside of Iran and also in Ukraine as well. Ukraine being our top priority most news days, but if there is massive news coming out of the Middle East, we of course will prioritize it like we have today and yesterday. I also have to thank everyone for supporting massively the Friends of the Israeli Defense Forces. Y'all were able to raise $3.6,000. Uh, actually, $3,576 to be exact, in support of the Friends of the IDF. And they are massively appreciative of the support. And they, of course, would thank the least for being a pro-Western organization, supporting Western interests throughout the entirety of the globe. I've got to say that I'm massively honored to have been able to run this stream. I know Enforcer Matt is as well, especially considering Indeed. especially considering that at the peak tonight, there was 12.2 thousand people live, and not only that, there was a whopping 101 thousand people that have viewed this stream so far. I am entirely honored so much, once again, that we were able to run this stream for all of y'all and share with y'all the news because we know that we hold a very special position getting to say the news to each and every one of y'all each and every night. And so with that, thank you all so much once again for watching. Good night, good luck, take care, stay safe. Slava Ukraini, Slava Israel, and long live the Lee Spring Army. The Lee Spring Army will never die. And good night, folks, and thank you all once again for another successful fundraiser stream. Like the Enforcer said, $3,576 raised for the Friends of the IDF. Truly tremendous to see, and thank you all once again for everyone's generosity. And with that, we'll see you all on Tuesday night at 10 p.m. Eastern, and also maybe tomorrow evening as well if anything breaks out. We'll cover that news live as it happens, if we can. And with that, Slav Ukraine, God bless Israel, and good night.